Okay, we've got the recording going. Everything looks fine and dandy. The only thing I don't have behind me is the green screen, but that's okay. I've already recorded this with the green screen, but it just didn't feel right. So I'm doing it again, and I'm not taking any time trying to get the green screen up because I don't know when I'll have this opportunity again. Forget me and my rambling. Here we go. And of course, I would have a little trouble trying to get the intro started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Conversations of Faith. And Conversations of Faith is, I don't know, a mini-series, a long, drawn-out series, however many the Lord wants. It's just going to be a series of videos where I endeavor to be encouraging, and well, I guess that's it, really. I endeavor to be encouraging. I endeavor to offset or help contribute to the counterbalancing of all the negative We've all been on social media. We know that there's a lot of negativity out there. So I want to try to be a part of that counterbalance. I uh, want to uh, take part in contributing to the positive increase in the world today. And I'm going to do this with the very first video about love. In this case, it's about why I believe love is the answer. Again, I didn't want to bother with the green screen because I really needed to get this out, but you'll see more green screen in the future. Why I believe love is the answer. The answer to what, Patrick? The answer to, like I said, the negativity in this world, the answer to all of the separation, all of the division, all of the anger, all of the hatred. I think love is the answer, but a very specific love. You know, it's not just any old love. It's got to be an unconditional love. It's got to be a love that reaches out to your fellow man, not just the people you know or the people that you're okay with. It's got to be an unconditional love that you're willing to expend without the promise of getting something in return, without it being reciprocated. I believe that the answer is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, in this video, you guys are going to hear me talk a lot about things from my perspective, my faith perspective perspective. Yes, I said that right. You're going to hear a lot of that. And while I am addressing Christians, I'm also addressing those of you who are without a faith or don't believe in a higher power, don't believe in God, don't subscribe to a faith. But it's my prayer that even if you don't, you'll be able to watch my videos and say, you know what? He is absolutely right. That makes a lot of sense. I don't know about this God stuff, but I do like what he's saying, and I think that he's on to something. That's my prayer. So without further ado, let's move on. We're going to talk about the types of love. There are four types, but only one is unconditional. You've got the, the storge type, which is the uh, empathy bond I put slash familiar. So you're able to, um, well, I don't know, like, like a family bond, I suppose, or someone that you're familiar with, someone that you empathize with, you know, you've, you've been there before, you have a bond with that person because you can relate to what they're going through or what they've been through or because you are related. Then you've got the philia bond, uh, and that bond is a brotherly or friendly bond. My wife discovered not too long ago that we have not been using the term blood is thicker than water in its fullest form. The, the full saying, I believe she said, is... The bond of blood is thicker than the water of the womb. I think we can all relate to that. Uh, in this case, it's talking about, you know, you love your family members, you love your siblings, but there are those bonds that you create with friends that are just strong. They're tight, you know. Um, so we have the philia bond. Then we have the eros bond. The definition was romantic, but I think... Eros comes from or is the root word to erotic, right? So there's the erotic love. Those three loves that I just mentioned all have conditions attached to them. You're only going to have storge love with people that you can empathize with. You only have philia bond with people that you've created the bond with. You've, I don't know why I'm doing this, like, ah, but you've created that strong bond with somebody. You've got the Eros love that you're only going to you're only going to take part in with people that you are attracted to. 
Well, I don't know. I don't know your life. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. Uh, maybe uh, you're unconditional with that. Um, but you get what I'm saying. The last love is the love that's important. The agape love. The unconditional love. And this is, did I say godly love? Yes. Unconditional God love. Now, this is that love that you perform because love is an action word, regardless of what kind you're talking about here. You perform this love unconditionally. So it doesn't matter who it is, you are willing to be loving towards that person, despite it not being reciprocated to you, despite it not being appreciated by the recipient. Okay, agape love. That's the important love. So let's go through a couple of Old Testament scripture. Uh, let's see, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 reads, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Wait, with all your soul and with all your might. Pardon me there. And then Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 reads, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. I have that underlined. I underlined that on purpose. Uh, you shall not uh, take vengeance or bear grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Like I said, I underlined that portion on purpose, your own people. You might be thinking to yourself, well, there it is, Patrick. The Bible says it right there. I can pick and choose who I want to show love to. I can pick and choose my own kinsmen if I want to, because the Bible said I can. It's Old Testament, man. Well, let's keep reading. We are next going to go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. This is Paul writing to the Galatian church, and he writes, For you have been called to live in freedom by my brothers and sisters, but do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Now, that verse alone can be... That can be a different, a different sermon, if you will, quite honestly, of a completely different topic. Uh, the topic of legalism and living in freedom in service to the Lord. Instead, this is verse 14, instead use your freedom to serve one another in love. No, I'm sorry, that's still verse 13. Verse 14 says, for the whole law can be summed up in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. What is he saying by your, the whole law can be summed up? Well, I will get to that. I will get to the uh, golden rule, and we're all familiar with the golden rule. But I'll get to that. What I want to talk about next is the great commandment, a package deal. Keep that in mind. The great commandment, a package deal. So, uh, you recall that I read from Deuteronomy and Leviticus, Deuteronomy saying that you should put, uh, you should love God above all else, and Leviticus that said, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, we are going to go to Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him, him being Jesus, this was a lawyer who stood up and tried to challenge Jesus while Jesus was speaking, I believe, in the synagogue. I believe in the synagogue. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy. This is a law that was handed down from Moses, well, from God to Moses and then from Moses to the children of Israel. We go on. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Wait a minute, Patrick. He just said the great commandment. I think he only asked for one. Why is Jesus giving him two? Well, I'll get to that. On these two commandments depend all the law of the prophets. Now, it's not the law of the prophets. The prophets didn't do anything outside of the command and the prompting of God. So the law of the prophets really came from God. But we're asking, well, hey, why is he giving us two commandments? Because I think Jesus is trying to tell the lawyer, listen, 
the great commandment is that you love me above all else. But if you do love me, you're going to have to love the rest of my creation too. You can't love me and not love the other members of my creation, your fellow kinsmen who is more than just your people, like Leviticus said, your own people, but everybody that I've created. I think that's what Jesus was saying there. Now, you can go into this and research it more for yourself, but I believe you might find the same thing. And again, for those of you who do not subscribe to faith, I'm hoping that you guys are hearing this and saying, yeah, that makes sense. I am so sorry about the light behind me, but you're not going to be able to see me well unless that light's on. All right, let's talk about the definition of a lawyer just real quick. A lawyer back then was an expert or scholar of Mosaic law, okay? I had to look that up because I was thinking to myself, no, this is not just a legal fella. I don't think somebody who's all about law is going to just stand up and question Jesus about God's commandments. But this is a lawyer of Mosaic law. So, you know, expert, scholar, I guess that's still kind of the same, but specifically in Mosaic law, which was their only law at the time. So now I want to go on to Luke chapter 10, verses 29 through 37. Now here we are going to read about another lawyer who stood up and asked how he shall obtain eternal life. I don't know if this lawyer heard the answer Jesus gave the first lawyer or if this lawyer knew the correct answer. And you'll see why I say that in a moment. But you'll see a similarity here. But he, oh, no, no, no. Ooh, I'm sorry, guys. Let me fix this real quick. Let me fix it. Let me see here. Is it 25? Ah, there we go. There we go. I fixed it. You see, I can do that. I'm I'm good at this. Not really. I just, I'm familiar enough with the program that I can do this. So, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this is a completely different question. The first lawyer asked, well, what's the great commandment? This is lawyer is asking how he can obtain eternal life. He said to him, this is Jesus talking, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So now Jesus is challenging him. He says, well, what, what, do you, what do you say is in the law? How do you interpret it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. There is the similarity. But again, notice, he didn't include in there, uh, love your neighbor who is your own people as yourself. And he answered to him, You have answered correctly, do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? This is a very interesting part, because this is where Jesus really describes exactly who he means by our neighbor. When Jesus has ordered us to love our neighbors as ourselves, Jesus is telling us who our neighbor really is. And so Jesus answers this lawyer with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Okay, so here's the thing about that. Jesus has made the Samaritan the hero of the story. These are Jews questioning Jesus. Je these are Jews that Jesus is talking to. This is a Jew that Jesus is answering. But the Samaritan is the hero of the story, or as you will see, is the hero of the story. Keep in mind, the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't like each other. They were at odds. They hated each other. They didn't see each other as... Uh, being each other's people. They hated each other. Uh, you could even say that they were prejudiced against each other. But Jesus made the Samaritan the good guy. Reading on, he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. 
and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy. This is the lawyer answering Jesus when he asked him, well, who do you think is the one that was the good guy? Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So there it is. There is our explanation of who our neighbor is. There is our explanation of who we are to show unconditional love to. And we know it's unconditional because... Jesus didn't give any conditions to this. He said, your neighbor. He gave an example of two people who were at odds or made the hero a, a member of a people that the Jews did not like. So there you go. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no exception to it. And I think that's where we're lacking when it comes to this world and all the problems that we see and all the negative negativity we see on social media. Now, I know there are a lot of people on social media that are trying to show uh, the good and the positive, but I think we could stand to have more people doing that, and that's what I'm endeavoring to do. I'm not trying to be a YouTuber. I mean, YouTube is saturated with people who know what they're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I just want to be a part of the answer, and I think that social media is a really good way to do that because it reaches a lot of people. I'm going to go to James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, because James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, really points out that there is no room for prejudice when you're loving your neighbor as yourself, but I'm only going to read verses 1, 8, and 9, okay? So I encourage you to go to James chapter 2 and read verses 1 all the way through 9. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? If you favor some people over others. Now, James is talking to other Christians. That's why he's saying uh, brothers and sisters. He's saying this because, you know, Christians don't have a problem loving Jesus, loving God. They don't have a problem, you know, declaring it, you know, or they shouldn't. But sometimes we do have a problem loving our neighbor. Yes, indeed. It is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. So right there, James makes it very clear that when you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you don't get to pick and choose who you're loving. You can't favor certain people over others. That's a sin. All right. So I mentioned the golden rule. Let's go to the golden rule. Let's talk about that. The golden rule. Oh, well, I forgot to edit that. So let me edit that in real time, too. Um. Ah, uh, there we go, because I'm not going to talk about the Good Samaritan here. There we go. The golden rule is found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Those of you who don't subscribe to a faith might not have known that this is in the Bible. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Okay. This is Jesus talking again. This is during his famous Sermon on the Mount. And this is something that he brought up. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Very straightforward. You know, he is not picking it. He's not saying you can pick and choose who you want to love. Uh, he's not saying pick and choose who you want to be civil towards. He's saying do unto others, everybody else, all of my other creations, all the other members of my creation, do unto others whatever you would like them to do unto you. So, again, another example that there is no room for prejudice. Let's talk about now the priceless value of love, the priceless value of loving your neighbor. Now, uh, we often think that, well, when we love certain people, it's not worth it because they don't reciprocate it, because they don't show any gratitude whatsoever, because we wound up getting punished for it. No good deed goes unpunished, right? Well, let's talk about the priceless value. We'll first talk about why love is so important in our lives, and then we'll talk about what love is and what love is, isn't. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3 reads, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but not have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, 
And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. So right there, we see that love actually validates our actions. And love validates our lives even. That part I'm kind of throwing in there, but that's how I feel. Love validates our lives. Unconditional love. It doesn't have as much of an impact if we're only loving the people that we like, or we're only loving the people that we know will pay us back. You know, that's, that's not the same thing. Uh, love validates what we do. We can be as busy in the church as we want to be, but if we're prejudiced, it doesn't mean anything. We can proclaim that we're doing everything that we can for the Lord and that uh, we love the Lord and that we don't want any, any uh, what you call that, um, oh, when we collect stuff, uh, uh, possessions. We don't want any possessions. We don't want silver or gold. We want nothing. We just want Jesus, but we don't have love for our neighbor. Then it's pointless. We, it doesn't mean anything because as we learned earlier on, it's a package deal. You love God. You're also going to love the members of his creation, your fellow man, your fellow man. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and continue on with what love is and what love isn't. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not reject, uh, excuse me, rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. I underline the truth because you know what? My truth might be skewed. My truth might not be very accurate because of my perspective. I am going to want the truth if I'm going to really put forth effort in showing love to my fellow man, to my neighbor. So, I'm going to look for the truth. And there is a baseline. Truth is not relative. There is a baseline. There is a standard for truth. And you can, you can find it if you look for it. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. Nostradamus makes some kind of uh, prophecy or prediction, and everybody's like, ooh, mysterious. And then maybe it comes to pass, and everybody's just losing their minds about it. He was right! But then it passes away, and everybody forgets what he talked about. As for tongues, they will cease. Nobody can talk nonstop. I mean, I, know, I, I think we all know some people who appear to be able to, but... No one can truly talk nonstop. Eventually, you're going to stop talking. Uh, and uh, as for knowledge, it will pass away. As you pass on knowledge, it might lose something in translation. So generations down the line, what was taught might take on a different meaning. Also, if you don't pass down knowledge, when it dies, it dies with you. But love, that sticks with you. And because love is an action word that you're going to you're going to perform it. And that sticks with a person. That sticks with you, that sticks with a person. Think about it. You, uh, you do something from your heart for somebody that you see is in need, and man, it just makes you feel great. It makes you feel better than any of the other accomplish accomplishments that you've uh, performed for yourself, that you've made happen for yourself. When you are acting selflessly, even if they don't appreciate it, even if it's not reciprocated, there's something in you that says, yeah, that was right. That felt good. The hard part. Folks, there is a hard part. We all know what the hard part is. That's loving your enemy. That's loving the people that really made it hard for you to love them back. Luke chapter 6, verses 35 through 36. But love your enemies and do good. And lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He is the He is kind to the great uh, to the ungrateful and the evil. Oh, excuse me. I need to wrap this up. Be merciful, merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Look, God loved us before we even thought about loving God. God loved us when we were doing our best to oppose God, reject God, rebel against God, when we hated God. Before we finally came to our senses and said, "You know what? You're right, Lord." I'm sorry, I'm coming home. And because God loved us and was patient with us and 
helped us out, we're expected to pay it forward. That's what 36 means. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. You've experienced that mercy. You continue to experience that mercy. Pay it forward. But the promise, the promise is awesome. Let's talk about that promise real quick. That is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Well, Patrick, we were talking about loving your neighbor. Now you're talking about seeking God. That doesn't sound like that's a promise to that. How do we seek God and his righteousness, the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Let's go to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28 again. Okay. Uh, and behold, a lawyer stood up. This is a second lawyer. Put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Jesus asked him, Well, how do you interpret the law? What does it say? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And, of course, Jesus' answer was, And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. That's, that's the promise. That's the promise. Because, remember, Paul even said to the church in Galatia, the whole law can be summed up in loving your neighbor as yourself. And remember, he's already talking to other Christians. That's probably why he didn't mention putting God above all else, because they didn't have a problem doing that. But perhaps they didn't understand that in loving God, you love the members of his creation. You love your fellow man unconditionally. Okay, it's been 26 minutes. Let's wrap this up, all right? So, uh, to put this all into a nice little package, when it comes to loving your neighbor, when it comes to contributing to the peace of this world, I see it like this. Uh, loving and serving others offers meaning and purpose. It validates our lives and our actions. It seeks the truth leaves no room for prejudice, and conquers all. And, you know, we know what conquering is. When you conquer something, you overcome and take control of. So when you're taking control of a situation, you're taking control of a situation for Christ, or Christ is giving you the power to take control of the situation. Uh, and in doing so, then Christ can use it to magnify himself and to use you to bring more people to him. Oh, man, I don't want to be used. Well, hey, look, you're going to be used by someone or something. You might as well be used by the author of love. He who knows how to be loving. He who knows how to reward you properly and fairly, right? Okay, so guys, that's all I have today. That's all I wanted to talk about. That's love. That's loving your neighbor. That's what we miss. And I hope that Many of you have uh, heard this and said, yes, we should make more of an effort to reach out. I know that many of you have already, and maybe you don't do it on a regular basis, but something in your heart, even if you're not a person who subscribes to a faith, something tugged at your heart to tell you, help that person. Love that person by helping them and giving them what they need. And despite the reaction, despite getting anything back from that person, you felt good. And I can guarantee you that even though that person didn't reciprocate it, maybe they didn't reciprocate it, maybe they didn't show that they appreciate it, but I guarantee you it stuck with that person. So love your neighbor, everybody. Love your neighbor as yourself. I can remember being in Georgia, and uh, I'm in Hinesville, Georgia. This is when I'm trying to make Georgia my home shortly after getting out of the military. 9 p.m., I'm sitting at home, and I come across Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, you know, the golden rule. I'm listening to classical music while I'm doing it, while I'm reading the Bible. I think it was Rachmaninoff. And I remember reading that scripture for the hundredth time, but man, it just, a light bulb turned on. And I started thinking, well, of course, you know, I wouldn't do those crazy things to myself, lie to myself, cheat on myself. Um harm myself physically, emotionally, and mentally, I wouldn't use myself. I wouldn't do any of that. So I shouldn't do it to anybody else. And if I don't want anybody else to do it to me, then I shouldn't do it to anybody else. Kind of a cycle there. 
I thought, wow, I mean, it's so plain. How did I miss that for so long? Again, I know that this is something you guys can hear and say, yeah, that does make sense, Patrick. That does make sense. So get out there, love people, and listen, I love you. I love you too. I don't know you. I can't even see you, but I love you. And regardless of whether you are religious, there is a God in heaven that loves you too. So much, in fact, that he sent his son to die in your place so that you could spend eternity with him, so that you can spend eternity fellowshipping with him and fellowshipping with other believers who have made the same uh, or accepted the same invitation that God has offered. Thank you for watching, everybody. It's very much appreciated, and I pray that this helped you guys. I pray that you got something out of it. Until next time, have a good day, and um, God bless. I got to go to my outro. I was about to end the recording. Let me go to my outro so it's more official.